All right, uh, today I'm, I'm talking about cervical spondylosis, uh, radiculopathy and myelopathy. So I sort of tried to group all these degenerative, mainly degenerative cervical conditions into one uh, talk. We'll just briefly touch on the anatomy, talk about the natural history of cervical um, spine degeneration, and then talk about the specific pathologies and their clinical um, presentation, and um, then what we can do as far as investigation and treatment and patient outcomes. So just a reminder about the um, cervical spine, the seven cervical vertebrae. The most the things that we're interested in from this point of degeneration um, is the size of the canal itself, and also we're interested in um, things such as the intervertebral discs, which would normally be sitting in uh, between the vertebral bodies here, but they've been removed, and the uh, foramina where the uh, nerve roots exit and a view of the upper cervical spine and the slightly different vertebrae at C1 and 2. So spondylosis is, describes age-related degenerative change in the spinal um, column and it may be something that is asymptomatic. So simply seeing something on imaging does not necessarily correlate with a clinical finding. Some studies have been done looking at um, MRIs and looking at disc degenerative change in various age populations. And they've shown that, um, as you can see these figures here, less than um, people under the age of 40, around about 25% have some degree of degeneration. And that goes through to uh, people above 60 years of age, around about 85% have some disc degenerative change. And again, this doesn't uh, correlate with uh, the rates of um, symptomatic patients there. But uh, degenerative change in the cervical spine can go on to cause three major clinical um, syndromes and it can cause a combination of these. Um, axial neck pain, um, cervical radiculopathy or radicular pain mainly into the arms and cervical myelopathy which is um, causing long track signs um, due to uh, compression of the spinal cord. So as far as just neck pain itself goes, Often when people present with neck pain, it's mainly due to muscular or ligamentous factors and this can be due to um, the way people are, are postured or their ergonomics if they're doing certain jobs um, and also muscle fatigue and it's been shown that people who have had neck injuries in the past are more likely to get neck pain as they get older. Um, degenerative changes themselves in the um, Bones and discs can be um, cause, can cause pain directly. Um, they've shown that they're nociceptive fibres both in the peripheral part of the uh, cervical disc, as well as in the as well as in the facet joints and the synovium there. And this has been confirmed um, doing provocative discography or facet joint injection that has been shown in some patients to, um, or the facet joint injection to relieve pain and the the provocative discography to. Um, highlight the, the amount of pain or the pattern of pain they're getting from a certain degenerate disc. When we're talking about cervical radiculopathy, this is um, pain secondary to uh, nerve root compression. And again, these patients, they have this degenerative cascade that um, starts uh, with intervertebral disc, um, which, which gradually loses its height and then it can bulge posteriorly um, and laterally and um, can bulge into the canal or into the foramina. Uh, the ligamentum flavum and the joint, uh, the joint capture of the facet joints can hypertrophy and infold. You can get osteophytes um, on the margins of the uh, vertebrae and all of these things added up can lead to um, a decrease in the size of the canal and the foramina and particularly in the foramina this can cause nerve root compression where the nerve roots are exiting. Um, also the, if there's a prolapse of the nucleus pulposus um, from the disc this can release some inflammatory mediators in that area that can also cause inflammation around the nerve roots. Uh, cervical myelopathy describes the long track signs caused by um, mechanical compression of the spinal cord. Um, animal studies have shown it requires about a 40% compression of the cord to create um, neurological uh, deficits. 
So if a patient has, has a less than 40% um, compression and neurology, it's likely that they have some other factors at play. Um, they can be developmental, so they can have a developmental stenosis um, of the uh, foramen of uh, the spinal canal. Um, and I'll, I'll go on to talk a bit about the imaging of that and the TORG ratio um, a little bit down the line. Um, patients also with a poor vascularity of the spinal cord, their spinal cord is more susceptible to injury with uh, less compression. And they also may have a different intrinsic morphology of the cord. Um, instability of the cervical spine can also um, increase uh, compression if, uh, during uh, motion of the neck. So clinical presentation, this can be quite wide ranging with these patients. So as I've mentioned already, spondylosis itself can be asymptomatic, even with a degree of cord compression. So sometimes these things are found um, incidentally on, on scans done for other reasons. Um, patients can present with neck pain, they can present with radicular pain or paresthesia, and um, often these uh, patients can have um, a sort of a global paresthesia in their arms that doesn't stick to a dermatomal distribution. They can present with uh, weakness um, in myelopathy, particularly in their lower limbs. They can have more weakness in the proximal muscle groups in the, in the quads and the thigh uh, compared to the distal. And this may manifest on a, as a patient saying they have difficulty standing up and getting out of a chair. Um, can also affect fine motor control, so patients can talk about the fact that they may find that they're a bit more clumsy with their hands or they have difficulty putting up, uh, doing up buttons, uh, things like that. And it can also manifest as gait changes, and initially gait changes can be quite subtle and may not be, patients may not complain about them, but they can be um, found on examination. So our clinical examination of these um, patients, we need to uh, assess them for any muscle wasting and they need a full um, exam, examination of both their upper and lower limbs as, um, as, as we mentioned, especially myelopathy can um, manifest in the upper and lower limbs. They should have a, an examination of their neck movements and often these patients have a restricted range of motion in their mm -hmm. neck and often a painful extension. They need to have a full neurological exam um, and the specific things, as we normally do, check their um, motor and sensory function. Their reflexes, they can be shown to have hyperreflexia and there are some specific tests for myelopathy which I'll go into in a second. Um, gait changes, as I mentioned, gait changes in myelopathy can be quite subtle. So there's a couple of tests. You can get the patient to walk on their heels and then on their toes and then do heel to toe walking and that can sometimes uncover some very um, subtle changes in their gait. Um, you can also do a Romberg test where you get the patient to um, stand upright, extend their arms in front of them and close their eyes and if they have a, um, any compression or injury in their dorsal column and they have issues with proprioception, they can, this can uh, lead to them falling forward. A quick reminder of the motor and sensory and reflex evaluation of the various nerve roots um, here, which I'm sure we're all aware of. And then these are some of the specific um, tests in the upper limb that we uh, look for in myelopathy. Um, in the uh, top row up here, this is the finger escape sign where you get the patient to hold their fingers in an extended and adducted uh, pose. And in patients with, um, with cervical myelopathy, their uh, ulnar two digits will uh, flex and abduct, usually within 30 seconds to a minute. Uh, the second row here um, shows the grip and release test. Uh, normally patients will be, able, without signs of myelopathy, will be able to make a fist and release it 20 times in 10 seconds. Um, with issues with fine motor control with myelopathy, they will uh, be a lot clumsier and slower at doing this. Uh, C here uh, shows us the uh, Hoffman reflex, where uh, you take the patient's uh, middle digit and um, snap the, uh, the distal phalanx into flexion. And in a patient with uh, myelopathy, they get spontaneous flexion of their other digits there. 
and uh, D shows us the inverted uh, brachioradialis reflex, um, which in a patient with myelopathy, um, testing the brachioradialis reflex will also result in um, hyperactive finger flexion. In these patients, looking at radiographic evaluation, one thing we need to have in our mind, first of all, is whether or not these patients require urgent investigation. And there's a couple of things that would, um, would lead us to uh, arranging that uh, immediately. If the patient has any sort of fracture, if they have any clinically relevant trauma, um, if there's any uh, signs of neoplasm, especially pain worse at night or any constitutional symptoms or a history of neoplasia, um, infection, again, constitutional symptoms of infection, um, recent invasive procedures or any sort of immunosuppression or IV drug use, and if they have any neurological injury. So patients that have upper and lower extremity symptoms um, or have a, a progressive uh, neurologic um, deficit, and especially if they have any blood, bowel or bladder symptoms, should be imaged uh, relatively promptly. A radiographic evaluation starts with plain x-ray. Patients initially should have erect um, films, which puts them in the posture that they're normally in, standing up. And again, as we mentioned, degenerative changes are not diagnostic. We can look at the TORG ratio, which is the ratio of the um, vertebral or the spinal canal itself um, to the uh, AP diameter of the uh, vertebral bodies. And a patient uh, with a ratio of less than 0.8 normally has a developmental stenosis, and this can put them at increased uh, risk of um, myelopathy, and it also puts them at increased risk of um, a uh, cord injury with uh, any sort of major cervical trauma. Uh, also doing flexion and extension views can help us assess the stability of the cervical spine. <laughs> Uh, moving on to CT, CT is very good at showing us the osseous anatomy and particularly if there's any um, uh, compressive osteophytes um, or um, bony stenosis of the foramen and any ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament. You can also do CT uh, myelography uh, where contrast is uh, injected in the epidural space. Um, and this has been shown to be a better diagnostic tool than MRI, but it is an invasive test. That gives us a good idea of um, exactly how much compression there is of the cord and also um, in the foramen, how, how much compression there are there. MRI is the standard for assessing the soft tissues. Um, and one thing about MRI, as we know, it shows us a lot and we need to correlate any findings we have on the MRI with the patient's clinical finding. Often they can have degeneration at multiple levels, but that is not necessarily a level that is causing problems. And we need to, again, go back to things like our clinical examination and um, get an understanding, especially if a patient has radiculopathy, if it's in a, a certain um, dermatoma or myotomal distribution, and uh, then correlating that with the MRI. MRI is very good at showing us with myelopathy any sort of intramedullary cord changes, um, any increased signal there. Having a look at uh, some of these studies, so this is a, a plain lateral C-spine x-ray and this is showing us uh, the X and Y here is, is looking at the TORG ratio. So this patient uh, in particular has a relatively um, narrow uh, spinal canal compared to the uh, AP diameter of their vertebral uh, body, so that will give them a decreased TORG ratio there and a, a developmental stenosis of their uh, canal. Uh, this is a CT, in, this, in fact a CT myelogram, so we can see the contrast around the cord here, and this can show us uh, compression um, at this level here, at, uh, C3, 4, and it also, as I mentioned, shows us very good the osseous uh, anatomy in that region. And here's a T2 weighted MRI scan and the um, particular features we're interested in this, as, as you can see there's disc bulges at several levels um, and uh, the, the dark and degenerate discs but uh, the thing that's uh, most striking here is the increased cord signal um, at uh, C5, 6, I think. 
Other tests we can do, we can do nerve conduction studies and EMGs if we are unsure of the diagnosis and um, this can go a long way to differentiating between a lot of um, neurological um, or nerve symptoms and illness. So as far as what we can do for this patient, um, we can start with non-operative uh, treatment. So in a patient presenting just with neck pain, they can have uh, the usual sort of analgesia and non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Um, benzodiazepines have been used um, as muscle relaxants in, in patients that may have muscle spasm, but there is a, a bit of debate about the uh, efficacy of those. Soft collars can be used for comfort if patients find um, they help. And um, physiotherapy, mainly for um, some light resistance, range of motion, and some isometric uh, exercises to strengthen around the neck. And if we think that the neck pain is coming from a, a degenerate facet joint, we can arrange a, a image guided facet joint injection. In patients who have radicular pain, we can do um, similar to the neck pain. We can also add in um, medications such as gabapentin or pregabalin um, for anyone with neuropathic pain and also arrange um, foraminal or nerve root injections. As far as operative treatment um, goes, there's a, a couple of indications for operative treatment. So in a patient who's had severely debilitating neck pain for greater than 12 months with no improvement or worsening with non-operative management, um, now there is controversy in spinal surgery as far as treating people just for neck or just for axial pain, just for neck or back pain, um, needs very objective confirmation of the level. So a patient can have a pro provocative discography where the um, uh, disc level that's thought to be problematic is injected at um, self and sometimes it's uh, insufflated with air. And this can um, lead to a, a rapid increase in pain and, and similar type of pain in the patient and confirm that that level is the one that's causing the issue. If that's the case, they can go on and have a discectomy um, done and a fusion at that level. A patient with, um, so a, a second indication is a patient with persis persistent radiculopathy. Um, and again, the key, I guess one of the key take home messages of this talk in, in total is that you need good correlation of your clinical and your radiographic findings um, if you want to select the right patients and do the right operation on them. And then in the group of patients with myelopathy, a severe or progressive myelopathy is an indication for operative treatment. Operative op options in the uh, cervical spine can be done either anteriorly, anteriorly through a uh, uh, cervical discectomy infusion. And there's a couple of different um, posterior techniques that can be done, either a, a laminotomy or foraminotomy, uh, laminectomy or laminoplasty, and we'll go into those in a second. And also when we are, are choosing what operative options we want, um, it can uh, rely on the architecture or the morphology of the problem. So a patient with a predominantly central or um, a bilateral disc um, protrude, protrusion is probably best uh, treated with an anterior operation. A, a lateral disc can be done either anteriorly or posteriorly. And um, a patient with myelopathy, we need to have an understanding of how many levels they have compression at. Um, three or less, it's thought, can uh, be done quite uh, effectively through an anterior approach, but uh, more than three segments um, or a developmentally narrow canal um, should be uh, done posteriorly. So an anterior cervical discectomy infusion is um, done through an anterior or Smith-Robinson approach, which I'll, I'll mention briefly in a second. Um, once getting to the vertebral canal, a, a subtotal discectomy is done and the end plates of the vertebrae are denuded of any cartilage and osteophytes. Um, if they have particularly um, degenerate um, vertebrae or if there's two adjacent levels, um, some people will go on and actually do a corpectomy of the um, vertebral body. They have a uh, bone graft put in at one level, it's usually done by a tricortical um, iliac crest bone graft and um, normally take two millimetres more of bone graft than the um, intervertebral space and this um, 
allows us to maintain the sagittal alignment of the cervical spine. Um, if uh, a corpectomy is being done, often using um, cages uh, to uh, fill the space in there and fill that with bone graft. And then um, the standard these days is to then go on and put an anterior plate on. Previous studies shown that a, a discectomy, anterior discectomy without a, um, with a, with a bone only fusion probably led to an increase in neck pain and instability. Major risks, there's some major neurovascular structures in that region, which we'll mention in a second, particularly the recurrent laryngeal nerve is the structure most likely damaged. And when things, as can happen at any level in the spine, when things are fused at one level, it can lead to adjacent segment degeneration. This is an axial uh, view through the, the neck um, of this uh, Smith-Robinson approach and it's, a, it's quite a good approach, it's a very anatomical approach other than uh, cutting through the platysma, um, it relies on planes um, between structures um, in the anterior neck. Um, and as you can see the, uh, the major structures go between the midline structures, the trachea, esophagus and the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Um, sits right in there and then the major neurovascular structures more laterally um, particularly the or the carotid sheath the carotid artery vagus nerve and uh, internal jugular artery um, the preference of most um, spine surgeons is to do this from the left side it's thought that uh, results in uh, less likely um, injury to the recurrent laryngeal nerve Uh, here's an example of a patient post-operatively. Um, as you can see at uh, C6-7 here, the um, intervertebral space has been filled up by bone grafts and there's a plate that's been put on anteriorly to uh, aid in fusion of that segment. Uh, posterior, um, posteriorly, so patients can have a, a laminotomy or foraminotomy where basically um, just the uh, bone in the region that's compressing the nerve roots um, around the foramen or the lamina is um, is removed and it's uh, other different from a full laminectomy they're just removing um, parts of the hemi lamina on that side um, and also taking um, a small amount of the uh, facet joint um, so as not to create uh, major instability there and if there's a, a soft disc protrusion that's also causing problem and excision of that extruded disc fragment. Uh, laminectomies uh, are done in the cervical spine, especially in patients with myelopathy who need decompression over more than three levels, um, done via a posterior midline approach. The main risks are the risk of um, kyphosis or instability, and it's now accepted mainly that um, laminectomies in the cervical spine should be accompanied by um, posterior instrumentation. And here's an example of a uh, posterior instrumentation of the um, cervical spine um, done over multiple levels following a laminectomy. And then the uh, last operation to mention is a laminoplasty where the posterior elements, the, the lamina aren't removed, but they are, are moved in place to increase the effective diameter of the canal. And um, the idea is by shifting the lamina dorsally, you can um, provide that increased um, space in the canal and decrease any sort of compression there. But by retaining uh, those posterior elements, you decrease your um, risk of uh, kyphosis. And uh, here's a, a diagram that shows how that is done. So the, the um, lamina is, is released on one side and, and is sort of rotated out of the way. And using um, plates, you can use plates either on one or on both sides. And on the CT here, they've also used a small amount of bone graft. And as you can get the appreciation here, by shifting those um, elements slightly posteriorly, you're increasing that canal diameter. So as far as outcomes of surgery go, as far as neck pain goes, there's no um, randomised controlled trials looking at surgery versus um, no surgery and neck pain. Um, but uh, some observational studies on, on patients who've had, uh, had surgery done shows that there is 
probably a good improvement in neck pain with anterior fusion, but not so much with posterior. Um, again, the key thing is that we need good evidence of a structural cause of their pain uh, before doing any sort of operation. And again, MRI correlation and um, provocative discography if required. Patients with um, cervical radiculopathy, um, by releasing the nerve roots, um, there's been shown to be good to excellent results in a uh, high proportion of patients. And um, like a lot of things with the spine, it's been shown that um, non-smokers do a lot better than smokers um, with any intervention. As far as um, using an anterior approach versus a posterior foraminotomy for a, a nerve root compression, it's been shown that there's no difference in the resolution of arm pain, so that is, um, they both give good results for that. Uh, the recurrence is higher with a, or a foraminotomy, but problems at other levels, um, uh, secondary problems at other levels, um, is higher with uh, an anterior effusion. Uh, there's been a, a, a meta-analysis done of um, 55 different studies which showed overall the trend was better with ACDF, but there was no um, uh, statistical significance with that. As far as the outcomes with myelopathy goes, um, they are mainly based on the amount of compression or how bad the myelopathy was beforehand, and particularly um, the amount of signal change um, in the cord on MRI. They've been shown that 50 to 75% show a neurological um, recovery, but the particular paper that, um, that I looked at with that didn't actually mention um, what that, you know, how much, they didn't quantify the, the recovery with these patients. Um, and it's been shown that there's no, um, no significant difference between techniques, whether or not the patients have, a, have a done anteriorly with less than three <coughs> levels or a, a laminectomy or a laminoplasty. Again, it comes down mainly to surgeon preference with those. But it has been shown they have less post-operative neck pain with the techniques. So in summary, degenerative changes in the cervical spine are common and don't necessarily correlate with uh, clinical findings and that's why it's very important to work these patients up properly with a, with a focused history, a good examination and using our investigations to guide our treatment and not just treating what we see on, on uh, radiographic findings unless they correlate with the patient. Um, these patients can be treated operatively or non-operatively and again generally the results are good if the correct patients are selected.